For immigrants leaving Europe for the New World, the passage across the Atlantic was the first of many adventures. At their destination, they were greeted by a spectacular backdrop. Manhattan. In the harbor, they were welcomed by a goddess of the modern age, holding high a promise. Anyone seeking to better their fortunes here would find freedom and security. This principle shapes the United States to this day. Freedom is paramount. It stands above everything, even justice. This idea continues to distinguish the United States from the democracies of the so-called Old World. The Statue of Liberty is a symbol of this principle. A gift from France, it was shipped across the Atlantic in 1885. She was intended as a beacon to the world, a bearer of hope for all who had left Europe behind. Millions arrived over the centuries, seeking a brighter future. But freedom could not be taken for granted, and long applied only to whites of European descent. A series of wars were fought before important ideals began to be put into practice. The first visual depictions of America by Europeans showed adventurers searching for a route to India, which is why they called the people they encountered Indians. The Europeans were interested in money and power, and a crucial factor in that power was religion. When Christopher Columbus set sail from Europe in 1492, he flew the flags of Catholic Spain. He was sent to find a new Western Sea Passage to Asia and lay the foundations for the spread of Christianity there. The Caribbean was a launching pad for later Spanish expeditions. With the help of new maps, the sailors searched for more territory to explore. They landed on a coastline they called Florida derived from the Spanish name for a flower festival on Easter Sunday, Pascua Florida. Columbus went to his grave believing he had reached India. Ponce de Leon, who had accompanied Columbus on a previous voyage, knew otherwise. But Ponce de Leon thought Florida was an island. He claimed it for Spain naming it La Colonia Florida. His ships were likely the first to sail the Gulf Stream at the place in the Gulf of Mexico where its current is strongest. De Leon's crews were amazed at how the powerful current left their ships rigging ragged and torn. The Gulf Stream transports more water than all the world's rivers combined. Its discovery was a boon to the Spanish treasure ships. Over the next 100 years, the current helped speed their journeys back across the Atlantic. The east coast of the U.S. stretches from Maine and the border to Canada down to Florida in the south. The New York metropolitan area now has 20 million residents, and Greater Miami as six million. When the Spanish set foot in the New World, their language and religion served as their anchor. In a testament to this heritage, some 50 million people in the United States speak Spanish today.
The freedom promised by the New World drew countless people who wanted to flee poverty and persecution. Over five centuries, they helped make the U.S. what it is today. A famous European engraver collected reports from 16th century expeditions and captured them in illustrations. More than any other, Théodore de Brie shaped how we picture the first encounters of the Spanish invaders with the indigenous peoples. His depictions were not always true to life, but the embellishments are not always as apparent as in this illustration of Native Americans at work tilling the fields. The Spanish had no real idea of how many Native Americans lived in the New World. Historians today estimate that more than one million people lived in Florida alone before the invaders arrived. The indigenous Americans helped the Spanish navigate their way through the unfamiliar terrain. Why the foreigners were always intent on moving on and what they were looking for was a mystery at first. The Spanish explorers asked them for water and food, but that was not all they were after. The Spanish were searching for precious metals and spices. They hoped to reap new riches. They wanted to wage a campaign of plunder, as they had already done with the Incas further south. But in Florida, the Spanish first had to contend with the difficult terrain. The many swamps, especially the Everglades, must have posed an immense challenge to them. Even today, the Everglades of South Florida is the only place in the world where crocodiles and alligators coexist. The Spanish struggled to cope with the natural environment, unlike the Native Americans, who had learned to thrive there over the centuries. They used sharpened tree trunks to pin down the dangerous reptiles before killing them. Theodore de Brie depicted this too, but how he learned of such details in the 16th century is still a mystery. Alligators are still found in Florida today. They live in fresh and brackish water lakes, rivers, and ponds. In some places, like in St. Augustine, they're also farmed. St. Augustine in northeastern Florida calls itself the oldest continuously occupied settlement established by the Europeans in the United States. Ponce de Leon came ashore here on his Florida expedition and then moved on. Fifty years later, the Spanish erected a small wooden fort. In the 17th century, after raids by English ships, the imposing Castillo de San Marcos was built in its place. Pirates found refuge in the islands of the region. Many had started as ordinary smugglers. When they saw galleons loaded with gold and silver setting sail for Europe, the lure of a quick profit was too much to resist. The Caribbean gradually became a haven for murderers and thieves. Eventually, Spain's dominance in the New World began to wane.
In 1607, English settlers landed further up the East Coast in what is now the state of Virginia. After entering Chesapeake Bay, three ships sailed up the James River. The passengers were supposed to build a fort for a new settlement, Jamestown. For people seeking a better life across the Atlantic, the Virginia Company of London offered free passage in return for work in the new colonies. After up to seven years of indentured servitude, they were given the right to settle on land assigned to them by the company. The English founded a succession of colonies along the East Coast, all the way up to modern-day Boston. Jamestown eventually flourished. For the Virginia Company, it soon became a worthwhile investment. The settlers also planted tobacco, which grew so well that Virginia tobacco is still the most popular in the world. The Europeans owe the discovery of tobacco to the Native Americans, who used its leaves for medicinal purposes. They treated snake bites with them and all manner of disease. In 1620, the Mayflower set sail from England with a crew of 31 and 102 passengers on board. They were motivated less by material wealth than by freedom. Most of them were fleeing religious persecution. They were heading for Virginia first, but poor weather diverted their ship further north to Cape Cod, near Boston. They landed in what they called Plymouth Rock, after the English port city they had set sail from. The Pilgrim Fathers are still part of the founding myth of the United States. Within just a few years, they were joined by 20,000 more colonists who settled in the New England area near what is now Boston. They laid the foundations for a deeply religious society where their free churches flourished. The Pilgrim Fathers, as they were later known, called themselves the Saints after St. Paul. Back home in England, they had been marginalized for their strict adherence to the word of the New Testament, which is why they were called Puritans. They believed their congregation answered directly to God and needed no bishops. They were even opposed to celebrating Christmas because the holiday was never mentioned in the New Testament. Compared to Jamestown colonists, the Pilgrim Fathers of the Plymouth Plantation adapted more easily to their new surroundings. They had good relations with the native peoples in the area who helped them survive their first winter. They gave the settlers food and showed them how to cultivate crops in the sandy soil. In thanks for the bountiful harvest, the settlers invited their native neighbors to a three-day feast, an event that inspired the modern Thanksgiving holiday. Over the 17th century, the Netherlands became another rising commercial and naval power. Cape May in New Jersey was founded almost 500 years ago by a Dutch explorer as a trading post with Native Americans. It is now the oldest seaside resort in the country. Each summer, 4,000 residents welcome more than 100,000 visitors. The fur trader Cornelius Jacobson May also brought Dutch settlers to an island nearby. They formed the nucleus of a new colony, New Amsterdam, today's Manhattan. By the mid-17th century, the Dutch settlement had 2,000 residents. The 
British fought three naval wars against their Dutch rivals and dispatched a fleet to take control of the Dutch settlements in the New World. The Dutch lost their colonies to the British. The governor was forced to relinquish New Amsterdam, which the British renamed New York. But the Dutch were permitted to keep their land, their faith, and their pubs. This tolerance displayed by the British commander laid the foundation for a gateway to the New World. The British had founded colonies in the south and north of the East Coast. They consolidated that foothold with New York and New Jersey, and later added colonies in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Their most successful colony was Virginia. Its prosperity spurred on other settlements in the South. As the farms increased their profits, they evolved into plantations. This success was founded on a workforce brought in from Africa. The captured slaves did the work that brought the landowners their wealth. The crops they grew included cotton, tobacco, and rice. English rule spread from Virginia to Maryland and North Carolina, South Carolina, and finally Georgia, the last and southernmost of the original 13 colonies established under British rule. The Middleton family were one of the most prosperous landowners in South Carolina. Their manor house still stands at the former plantation. The family owned 20,000 hectares of land, some 50,000 acres, worked by 800 slaves, not far from the thriving city of Charleston. By the mid-17th century, Charleston was the cultural and economic center of the southern states. With a population of 1,200, it was at the time the fifth largest city in North America. Its port became a hub of the slave trade in the British colonies. Half of the slaves captured in Africa and brought to North America landed in Charleston. It was a cruel and barbaric business that paid no heed to any contemporary notion of human rights. Slave owners were allowed to do whatever they wanted with the people who were their property. Charleston prospered under the slave trade, and the British crown filled its coffers with taxes. In the colonies, this bred resentment, and they began to turn against British control. The colonies were flourishing and did not want to follow orders, whether in their business dealings or their religious beliefs. From the north to the south, this was something they agreed on. Eventually, in Boston, tensions boiled over. When London issued new duties on basic commodities such as paper, leather, and tea, the colonies demanded no taxation without representation. Their protests were met with force. The conflict turned deadly when British soldiers shot and killed five people during protests in Boston. The King in London now offered to abolish all taxes except for the tax on tea. But it was too little, too late. The revolutionaries in Boston now openly challenged the government in London. Under cover of darkness and disguised as Native Americans, a group of them crept aboard British trading ships and threw 40 tons of tea into the harbor. The raid went down in history as the Boston Tea Party. London responded to the provocation by sending reinforcements. In 1775, British troops clashed with colonial militias for the first time.
The 13 colonies issued a declaration of independence and a declaration of war. Thomas Jefferson penned key sections of the Declaration of Independence. He became one of the founding fathers of the United States. Along with Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Adams, and a tobacco farmer from Virginia called George Washington. They were united in their determination to be free of what they called British tyranny. Their declaration also proclaimed that all men had a God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was a call to rebellion. But were the colonies willing to die for their cause? They had 15,000 poorly equipped militia troops under the command of a military novice, plantation owner George Washington. They faced the well-equipped and battle-hardened British Redcoats, backed up by 30,000 mercenaries from Germany. But George Washington had patriotic fervor and tactical skill on his side. He managed to avoid open battle against the enemy's superior forces. His militia was more accustomed to retreating than going on the offensive. But the British were unable to press their advantage. Then George Washington received military assistance from France. The tide turned. The decisive battle took place not far from Jamestown. The British surrendered and London sued for peace. The United States had now come of age. Can you see by the dawn's early light? The birth of the nation inspired Francis Scott Key to write a poem about the Star's Spangled Banner. This later became the lyrics to the national anthem, which celebrated the United States as the land of the free and the home of the brave. But who was truly free in this new world? Women had less freedom. Native Americans and slaves of African descent had none at all. The freedoms that were enshrined in the Constitution were only valid for a select group. It soon became clear that rice grew well in the southern states. New slaves were imported who understood how to cultivate rice. This also proved a very profitable business. Thanks to enslaved rice farmers from West Africa, South Carolina and Georgia soon became known as the Rice Coast. But diseases like malaria and yellow fever also flourished in the subtropical climate. When temperatures rose in the spring, white farm owners often left for the north. Over the summer, the slaves were left in comparative peace. They developed their own African-American culture and their own language, Gullah, which is still spoken today on the sea islands of South Carolina. In 1790, the islands were home to around 200 white colonists and 1,700 black slaves. Eighty years later, some 300 colonists ruled over more than 5,000 slaves. As each decade passed, the flaws of the American Constitution became more apparent for those who were willing to see. In the North, the thorny questions of freedom and equality were at least a topic of debate. In the South, it was business as usual. The South had its own concept of freedom. To the plantation owners, it meant the right to free trade and freedom from interference from both the British and the Northern states. In 
The Virginia Company of London was the first joint stock corporation to import slaves from Africa to Jamestown. The slaves replaced white indentured labor, who gained their freedom after completing their years of service that covered the cost of their journey from England. For their owners, the people brought from Africa would never be free in the New World. They lived to serve. Slaves who attempted to escape faced brutal punishment. The United States of America, which thought of itself as the land of the free, was built on slavery. By 1860, there were some four million slaves in the United States. Men, women, and children exploited by slave owners and often abused. A few years earlier, in 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe, a teacher, published a novel that gripped the country. Uncle Tom's Cabin tells the story of a slave who is sent to be freed, but is then sold to another master who has him whipped to death. For Abraham Lincoln, born in Kentucky, and his new Republican Party, the book helped win support for the anti-slavery cause. Abraham Lincoln became president with votes from the northern states. In the White House, he faced a challenge of historic proportions. After his election, South Carolina moved first. Soon, 11 slaveholding states seceded from the United States. The president decided to use the military to force the South back into the Union. The Civil War, waged over differing definitions of freedom, cost the lives of 600,000 soldiers and 500,000 civilians, 2% of the population. It remains the country's bloodiest conflict. Half of those killed could not be identified. In May 1861, the white slave owners on the Sea Islands had, like every year, left for the summer. Their slaves remained behind. The North took the opportunity to seize control of the islands and armed several hundred Gullah slaves. Many of the men took pride in wearing the blue uniform and in joining the fight for their freedom. Union forces soon occupied the nearby city of Beaufort thanks to the 1st South Carolina Volunteer Infantry Regiment. It was one of the first black regiments in the Union Army. The North now began to deploy more and more units of black soldiers. 180,000 African-American men gave Lincoln the new troops he so desperately needed on the battlefields. Another factor helped the industrialized North. Its railway network allowed troops and weapons to be transported quickly across the country. Many of the battlefields were located close to railway tracks and the towns that had sprung up near to them. The Union of the Northern States was gaining the upper hand. The Confederate South staked everything on one final push to encircle the Northern armies.
They were outmatched, both in terms of resources and strategy. The Confederate Army lost their final great battle. Their only choice was to surrender. Abraham Lincoln had been re-elected the year before the end of the war. After the South capitulated, he urged reconciliation, calling on both sides to refrain from taking revenge. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. But the Civil War claimed one more life. One week after the end of the conflict, President Lincoln and his wife attended a performance at the Ford Theater in Washington. Maybe I don't know the matters of polite society, but I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you psychologizing old man trap. At the pinnacle of his success, Abraham Lincoln paid the ultimate price for his vision of freedom. He was shot dead by Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. More than a century and a half later, wounds may have healed, but they have not been forgotten, and old resentments lurk under the surface. During the war, both sides prayed for God to grant them victory in a conflict fought over land, resources, and their different definitions of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The rights enshrined in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence proved easier said than done. The Navasink Twin Lights Lighthouse overlooking the entrance to the Bay of New York is a good vantage point to gaze on what may be the quintessential American dream, the journey from rags to riches. For more than a handful, this dream became reality. The city of New York had a claim to becoming the nation's capital, as it was for a year under George Washington, the country's first president. It is a melting pot of peoples and cultures. On the way toward Manhattan, the Statue of Liberty symbolizes what the nation's founding fathers had put to paper in the Declaration of Independence from British rule, an end to tyranny and liberty for all. Across the Atlantic, people in France were fascinated by political developments in the United States. The years that followed independence and then the shock of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Paris responded by commissioning a statue that would be a beacon to the world. Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi was asked to design the monument. The project almost foundered due to lack of funds. It took five years to secure financing for the first sections of the statue. First, Bartholdi designed the head, which he is said to have modeled after the face of his mother. Her left arm cradled a tablet inscribed with the date of the Declaration of Independence. The statue was scheduled to be completed in time for the Declaration Centennial, but the construction proved difficult and the original delivery date could no longer be met. The completed sections of the statue went on tour to raise funds to finish the rest. At 
the World Fair in Paris, millions marveled at the statue's head, while in Philadelphia and New York, the right arm and torch were exhibited. Visitors went up to the balcony that circled the torch. The publicity worked. When the Statue of Liberty was assembled for the first time in France, wealthy Parisians eagerly paid for the privilege of climbing the scaffolding. Ten years behind schedule, Lady Liberty was boxed up and shipped off to New York. She initially served as a lighthouse, complete with an observation platform around the torch. Today, the balcony is closed to the public. But from the beginning, the gift by the French people served its intended purpose. The Statue of Liberty is a landmark for New Yorkers and a powerful symbol to the world. Only a short distance away is Ellis Island. For new immigrants from Europe, it became known as both an island of hope and an island of tears. Europe was suffering from hunger and political and economic unrest. During the 19th century, 52 million people left the continent. In many cases, their home countries helped support the immigration of entire families to help alleviate poverty back home. The mass immigration required organized collection points on the European side of the Atlantic. Many people departed from Hamburg. After a devastating fire in 1842, the port city was rebuilt. The harbor was massively expanded, as were the shipyards. Hamburg became a gateway to the world. While sailing ships used to need two months to cross the Atlantic, by the late 19th century, modern steamships made the journey in just two weeks. A growing number of migrants were now arriving from Eastern Europe and the Balkans. The Hamburg America shipping line built a camp for them on the outskirts of the city. Passengers had to endure a 14-day quarantine. This prevented the outbreak of diseases on board the ships, which could cause people to be turned back in New York. Passengers traveling first class had their belongings packed securely in trunks. Their tickets cost four times the price of a lowest class ticket. But this is where the ship operators made their profit. Passengers were crammed into bunks in rooms with no windows. Emigration became a huge money maker. Ships took passengers west and loaded up with cargo for the return journey east. For many migrants, it meant saying farewell forever and a departure to the unknown. Thanks to growing competition among shipping lines, even third-class passengers soon had more amenities on their journey. At the same time, ticket prices dropped. In 1850, the journey cost an average annual wage. By 1900, it was one month's income. Families who couldn't afford to send everyone often sent the men ahead first. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, wrote the poet Emma Lazarus in honor of the Statue of Liberty, which welcomed the ships bringing immigrants to New York. 
But for those who hoped to achieve the American dream, there was still a hurdle to overcome. Ellis Island, island of hope and tears. Passengers of wealth or social standing were allowed to step off the boat and go straight to Manhattan. Passengers in third class were made to submit to a rigorous screening process. The initial interview took only a few minutes. The medical exam was an ordeal. This was what decided who would have a chance at the American dream. At first, only passengers suffering from disease were rejected. Later, the authorities also blacklisted prostitutes, the poor, anarchists, the illiterate, and Chinese people. Those denied entry were returned to where they came from, at the cost of the shipping company. On some days, up to 12,000 people were processed at Ellis Island. In the late 19th century, Germans were the largest group of immigrants, followed by people from Ireland and Britain. But many Russians, Hungarians, Italians, and others sought their fortunes in the New World. For passengers traveling in first or second class who went straight to Manhattan, the American dream was not such a reach. The others who disembarked at Ellis Island had a more difficult path. But still, some rose to a life of prosperity in their new home. Levi Strauss, born in Bavaria, emigrated with his mother in 1847 and went on to make Levi jeans a mass consumer product. Heinrich Steinweg arrived in New York from Hamburg in 1850. He went on to become world famous for his Steinway pianos. Henry John Heinz, who invented tomato ketchup, was born in the U.S., but his father came from Germany. As did another immigrant, Friedrich Trumpf, grandfather of Donald Trump. Before and after becoming president, Donald Trump campaigned for more restrictive immigration policies and for a wall along the border to Mexico. The vast majority of European immigrants arrived through New York, even those who planned to continue to the Midwest. Immigrants who stayed in New York generally settled in specific neighborhoods, which became Little Italy, Little Germany, or Little Russia. Their children were automatically granted American citizenship through birthright. New York had become a modern-day Babel, and not just because of the many languages spoken there. As the decades passed, the city's new buildings towered higher and higher, trying to outdo each other and outdo other cities. The first high-rise was built in 1885. It had 10 stories. In 1889, the first skyscraper with a steel skeleton structure was built. A decade later, the tallest building soared 100 meters. Ten years after that, double that height. In 1931, the now legendary Empire State Building topped out at 381 meters. It held the world record for more than 40 years until the limitations of steel-framed buildings were overcome. Not far away, the state of Maine shows another side of the country, endless expanses instead of crowded cities. The islands in Penobscot Bay haven't changed much since the first Europeans arrived here. 
Some of the tiny islands have just one house, or none. Ilo Ho has a population of just 70. It was given its name in 1604 by the French colonist Samuel de Champlain, who also founded the province of Quebec in Canada, the cornerstone of New France. Ilo Ho is a place where time seems to have stood still. An 80-year-old Ford Model T pickup is no rarity here. The island didn't get its first telephone landline until 1988. In 1603, Samuel de Champlain founded the first of a string of settlements for France in North America. The first was on an uninhabited island. Later ones followed along the St. Lawrence River. Samuel de Champlain came into contact with Native Americans who thrived in the forests that were rich in game. They were willing to go into trade with the French. With their help, the French founded Acadia, a colony whose name is still recalled by the Acadia National Park. But in the 18th century, the Seven Years' War and the War of Austrian Succession brought European conflicts to the New World. England and France competed over land and over wood. Timber from Maine was a valuable commodity. The French ended up having to cede most of their New World territory to Britain, although the Quebec region in what is today Canada remains French-speaking. But those who lost the most were the Native Americans. Their traditional hunting grounds had been deforested, their lakes and rivers depleted of fish. They were even prohibited from hunting and gathering. Much of the forest was now privately owned. Richard Henry Pratt, an army major assigned the task of assimilating Native Americans, is still known for his motto, kill the Indian and save the man. But the idea of civilizing the supposed noble savages doomed Native Americans to lives of poverty at best. Many were killed. Native Americans faced the threat of arbitrary violence wherever they went. The descendants of Europeans never lost their suspicion of Native Americans and resorted to military force to displace them. This may not have accorded with the word and spirit of the U.S. Constitution, but in the New World, might was still right. By the turn of the 20th century, the indigenous people had been decimated. Only 237,000 Native Americans remained. They lost 98% of their land to the invaders, and they had to wait until 1948 to be granted full civil rights in all states, nearly 80 years after the first African Americans won the right to vote. Five hundred years of colonization and displacement for some, for others, 500 years of the American dream. Soon after the dawn of the 21st century, that dream came under brutal attack. On September the 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center was targeted as a symbol of the ideals of the Western world. Almost 3,000 people were killed in the attack, people who had roots in all corners of the earth. But the open society whose foundations had been laid by the courage of the pioneers refused to be intimidated. The new Freedom Tower, adjacent to the former site of the World Trade Center, is a testament to that determination. Today, it fills the gap in the New York skyline. The Spanish were the first European conquerors of the New World. 
Their legacy today includes over 50 million Spanish-speaking people in the United States, more than in Spain itself. But the pillar of the American dream was and remains liberty. The belief that people could come from around the world and achieve their dreams. Or as one son of Italian immigrants sang, if I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere.